Gary Phillips. He is the co-editor and contributor to the Cocaine Chronicles. Gary Phillips is also the president of the Southern California chapter of the Mystery Writers of America. His latest novel, The Warlord of Willow Ridge, is a collision between crime and suburban moors during the Great Recession. He is currently writing a graphic novel about a community's fight against water privatization, which may be our future. But anyway, <laughs> Gary Phillips. This is an excerpt from uh, Disco Zombies. It's about uh, two men who uh, steal a shipment of coke from two other men and are hiding out <clears throat> with a couple of lady friends, and then the zombies show up. <laughs> there was a loud retort of wood splintering and the crash of the front door being ripped from its hinges. Spree! McMillan yelled, and Fernandez squealed from the front room. Holmes and Corso had already scooted out of bed. He put on his boxers. She tossed the six-shooter to him. He tore into the living room, expecting that somehow muscle sent by Kreider and Wild Willie had found him. There was no way he could have anticipated what was waiting for him. Oh, shit, he breathed. Do something, Spree, McMillan pleaded. He was naked and pinned against the wall. Fernandez was clad in her panties and half lying off the couch on her back, her eyelids fluttering, a bruise well on her jaw. Holmes extended the gun and shot one of the things that had invaded the home. The bullet punctured the creature's eye socket, and that should have emptied, should have put down any normal man. But as Holmes was rapidly grasping, they were not normal beings. Zombies, Corso grasped from behind him. The one that had its hand around McMillan's throat was dressed in tattered clothing of a unmistakable vintage. He had on a dirt-stained silk shirt with billowing sleeves, once tight bell-bottom slacks, a belt with a huge lettered buckle, and platform shoes. <laughs> the other creature was dressed in what had formerly been a white suit with a matching vest and a blue superfly collar point shirt open to expose a bony chest that blind earthworms crawl in and out of. <laughs> This one had a raft of gold, now moldy green chains and medallions draped around its neck, and the remnants of a puffy afro full of leaves and twigs. He held on to the two bricks of coke. The feculent odor rising from the two zombies was overpowering and caused Corso to gag. Holmes was more concerned about his dope. Medallion zombie had turned toward the door and Holmes shot him in the knee. The bones popped and the creature stumbled as if it had stepped into a pothole. Holmes ran forward, but bell-bottom zombie threw, Medallion, threw McMillan at him and he had to prone out to avoid being struck. They're taking our powder, Holmes yelled, launching himself and tackling the bell-bottom one. The monster made a guttural sound and hit him hard behind the neck and Holmes was knocked to the floor, dazed. Coke, Afro Zombie growled <laughs> to his buddy. Coke. The other one said, smiling. Dung and beetles spilled out of his maw. The two shambled out of the hole they'd made ripping through the door. Afro Zombie walked lopsided due to the decimated knee now. Spree, spree, get up. Corso shook him. Holmes got to a knee like a fighter taking an eight. Come on, Corso said, heading out, wearing pajama bottoms, her pump shotgun cradled in her arms. The two zombies were heading up the hill behind her house, and Holmes and Corso went after them, joined by a limping McMillan who tied the, com who tied the comforter around his waist. The two creatures were nearing the top of the rise. Greedy motherfucking zombies, McMillan exclaimed. He looked around and spied a rock about the size of his fist. He picked it up and threw it, hitting the bell-bottom zombie in the back. This thing turned around, growling and flailing his arms. He charged at them, and Holmes grabbed the shotgun out of Corso's hands and swung the stock at the thing's head. This knocked loose skin and gray, dry flesh, but it kept coming. Holmes made a swing again, and the creature caught the weapon and cracked it, 
out of, and shattered it out of Holmes' hands. He broke it apart by banging it against a thick tree trunk. At this, as this was going on, Afro Zombie made, made it over the top of the hill and disappeared. Get the coat, Holmes directed McMillan. We'll take care of this undead shithead. <laughs> Don't have to tell me twice, McMillan said, running. Holmes shot the zombie again, and it turned toward him, snarling at the continuing irritation of Holmes putting bullets into it. The thing was upon him and clawing and snapping its jaw. Holmes was down and his back, on his back, and he drove a fist into the creature's ribcage. Some of the brittle bones cracked, but it was taking all of Holmes' effort to keep the monster from eating his face off. Get off! Corso screamed, jumping on the zombie's back and pummeling him. Oh, the creature intoned. It reached around and pulled Corso off by her hair and flung her away. It got its bony hands around Holmes' neck and squeezed, causing him to gag. The zombie's jaws opened and unhinged, and the creature bent down to feast. Hey, zombie, Ella Fernandez hollered. She brought the Jack Daniels bottle down on its head. The thick glass broke apart, causing a dent in the side of the creature's skull. The alcohol spilled over its upper body. I've got something for you, you dead bitch. Fernandez avowed as the zombie started for her. She flicked on a zip, she flicked on a zippo and threw it on him, lighting his head on fire. The zombie wailed and stomped around. I guess it doesn't like fire, being on fire, Holmes observed wryly. His grass stained fruit of the looms. The zombie was running around in a circle, screaming. It bumped into a tree and knocked itself down. But it didn't have enough presence of mind or enough brains left to roll and try to put out the, the now totally, his now totally aflame body. He got back up and screamed some more, accelerating the fire. Corso helped Holmes to his feet. Oh, it's the way he died, she said. She started to run up the hill. We better get up there. The yayo, Holmes remembered as he, as he and Fernandez also took off. At the top, it was a regular zombie jamboree going on. More of them, seven more of them were up there and they crawled out of their graves and all were dressed in disco regalia. <laughs> there was a female zombie and what was left of a miniskirt. She wore torn fishnet stockings over charred legs and a stretched stretch velour top hugging a worm infested chest. Another was in a spangled studded safari suit and broad, broad pimp and broad brimmed pimp hat. Part of his entrails hung from a gap in a safari shirt. Yet another was in hot pants, thigh high platform boots, and her angel sleeve blouse was being ripped off by another zombie in a poncho, gaucho pants, and dingo boots. <laughs> the zombies were growling and snarling and tearing at each other to get to the cocaine. What the hell, Holmes said. Of course, so quick. They're the ones who were killed in the fire. What are you talking about, Jamie? Fernandez asked, New Year's Eve, 1980. The mini-skirted zombie had pulled the arm off the other one in the gaucho pants and was beating him with it. <laughs> coke, coke. <laughs> she repeated as she drove the other one to the ground. Some local talent built a club down here, inspired by Donna Summer, just Studio 54. You know, all of that, Corso said. Holmes said, there used to be a disco here? Yeah, it was called, and this would prove to be ironic, Disco Inferno. <laughs> from what I understand, it was a popular place from 1976 when it started to the night it burned down. The bicentennial to the death of Disco. Mm -hmm. Holmes gasped. Not a religious sort. He nonetheless sent a prayer up to, that, to the sky, hoping the gas would rain down and the Lord would then add a few lightning bolts to set fire to these greedy, motherfucking coat-snatching zombies. 